going on guys it is brian and jack and might be a stranger to you but he's been on this channel before and we are back with another creator spotlight episode on superman's comics jack this guy was so good he wrote over the ropes we talked about over the ropes on here before we got him back again what are we going to talk about tonight jack well, we're going to talk about another Mad Cave Studios release from Mad Cave's newest hit maker, Jay Sandlin. We're talking about Hellfighter Quinn. We're taking it outside of the wrestling ring, and instead, we're going into a full-on Kumite-style superhero tournament. Kumite, Kumite. I can just hear that Bloodsport song. But yes, Jay Sandlin, welcome back to the channel. Tell us about this awesome comic you have in Hellfighter Quinn. Jack, I love that description, first of all, because we are taking it from the wrestling ring where it's not choreographed. It, it, there's, there's no pre-planned finishes. And this time you win by death, KO, or ring out. And that is Hellfighter Quinn. The tournament begins uh, today, if, if you're watching, if you're in local comic shops, new comic book day, uh, March the 4th. Uh, so be sure, like Jack and Brian said, check out Hellfighter Quinn, Mad Cave's uh, Bloodsport meets Mortal Kombat uh, Tournament of Power uh, between five clans for an object, a mysterious object known as the Azure Sun. Yeah, I also want to take this time to think if you're listening on the audio version of this, thank you so much for tuning into that. And if you aren't aware, we do have that Simple Man's Comics podcast, so be sure to check that out wherever your podcasts are found. Hellfighter Quinn, we were able to read an advanced issue of this. Got the PDF version from Mad Cave. I love this issue. We, we talked a little bit about it when we had John over the ropes, but this one, now we're getting full into it. It's a mix of fantasy and Harlem. And like you said before, we got a little blood sport tournament type style going on, but I enjoyed this first issue. Great start. I like the pacing of it. I like the art. I like the story. I like, we get kind of a tragedy within the, within the first, what, 10 pages, right? Yes. This, uh, like you said, there's Harlem. That's where our uh, main character, Quinlan Jones, uh, is the former vigilante of Harlem, um, known as the Hellfighter, you know, but he, he's part of a group, you know, in Harlem known as the Clanless, and he's retired. He, he didn't want the violence of that life anymore, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, Bruce Wayne in the beginning of The Dark Knight Rises a bit, and one of his students at the uh, boxing gym you know, Jax's costume takes his invitation to the tournament, the tribunal, and basically cosplays as the Hellfighter. And, you know, you find out on the first uh, panel or so, uh, it doesn't work out so well for the student. And so the real Hellfighter's got to come in there and, you know, falls into the, exactly what he was avoiding, you know, entering the tribunal fighting in this tournament against the uh, competitors from the other clans. You know, there's an assassin clan of ninjas. There's a, a cyber clan of, uh, you know, cybernetics and cyborgs. Uh, the most powerful group are the Queens clan, and they've been kind of running the show uh, for the duration of the tribunal, kind of like the New York Yankees of the, uh, of the tournament. And the uh, champion, is uh, a fellow by the name of Invictus, kind of an evil Superman type. So Quinn's going to have his hands full with all of these competitors for the next five issues. So I, I'll say upon reading this, the first thing that kind of caught me off guard, um, you know, you get, you see a book, you see the solicit, you see the cover art, you, you kind of get an idea of what to expect, but you never really know until you get in and read. I didn't realize almost the superhero element of the book which I found to be really kind of fascinating. And it had almost, it gives you almost a Secret Wars vibe where you're having these vigilantes and these, these kind of over the top characters really engage in this, in this battle. Um, and it really kind of made me want, and, and this is almost an aside, but I want that, uh, that Hellfighter kind of origin story. I need that, that uh, year one Quinlan. We got to go back at some point and, uh, and, and see him wrecking, things in Harlem. I would love to, I would love to see that, but uh, it's really kind of a different uh, uh, vibe than uh, I initially expected. Can you speak on 
when you were going into writing this book, was there a certain aesthetic? Was there a certain kind of story you were looking to tell? There was a very, uh, going into writing this book, finding the balance and the pacing was the biggest challenge. Because like you said, there is a desire to kind of tell the story of the Hellfighter, or I could tell the story of a tournament. Because you only get so many pages, you can't really do both. Um, and with a tournament, I the aesthetic I thought of was almost like a game of Mortal Kombat brought to a comic book. And I thought about how in Mortal Kombat, you move up the tiers. You know, you start with your first opponent, your first tier opponent. Usually it's, it's like Reptile, you know, so you, and then you beat Reptile, you move up the ladder, you get up all the way until you're fighting Goro and then, you know, uh, Shao Kahn or somebody. I, I didn't want to get bogged down in... Uh, so much exposition and backstory that I didn't get to show the fights and show Quinn moving up in the tournament, you know, each issue. Um, because five issues can go pretty fast. And if you don't chart it just right, you might just have like two fights and then you're on the final issue. Then what do you do? So yeah, going into it, I based the story around the action. I definitely put the action first and let those things like you mentioned, like the things you want to see about where the Hellfighter comes from, what's his neighborhood like, how did he end up here? Um, those kind of get peppered in. So uh, definitely uh, the pacing was the most challenging thing and also the, also the most fun part because, uh, you know, just coming up with... Um, brutal moves and uh, you know I, I finding a uh, reference art for it probably put me on a few watch lists <laughs> but uh yeah they let me go all out with the violence i was glad for that so that's where i wanted to get at also well first take a step back you mentioned mortal Kombat when i was reading it and kind of how jack uh, touched on it i was thinking like marvel versus capcom but what was great about it is it's new characters it's not someone that you're familiar with so you kind of build the backstory while you're reading it you talked about the pacing of five issues. I think the pacing for the first issue was perfect. But we always talk about Mad Cave, and from what we've heard about Mad Cave is they're kind of liberal with their writers letting them write the story that they want to write. How was that process? We talked about it certainly for Over the Ropes, but how was that process with Hellfighter Quinn for you? Hellfighter Quinn was a little different than Over the Ropes. Um, I didn't create Hellfighter Quinn and the backstory. They came to me with the IP kind of already in place, and uh, they had a few more parameters, um, mainly like, you know, we need A, B, and C. They knew they wanted the five clans. They knew they wanted the Azure Sun. And they also knew uh, with this one that they wanted... Uh, some Harlem style dialect and some, uh, you know, for it to sound legit. So my process there was to go and read up on, you know, slang and vernacular in Harlem. And in the first issue uh, in the script, I way overdid it in, uh, in a draft. I just put all the Harlem slang I could find uh, just as much as I could. And then I went back and washed it. And after doing that two or three times, um, you know, the editors and, and I working together, we, we would find a balance and find a voice, really. Finding Quinn's voice was the most important aspect. And they do allow a lot of freedom, but um, the editors are, are still a guiding hand for sure. Now, there was, we were kind of talking about it, and there's one line in that comic book where um, the character, I don't want to spoil too much, but there's like a mermaid looking character in there. And there's like a one line Harlem slang line in there. Can you tell us about that? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's Harlem slang, but yeah, Myrmidon, who is kind of like the creature from the Black Lagoon meets Predator, is his uh, first opponent. And um, they, they come together, they fight, and, you know, they, they had told me I could kind of go as far as I wanted with the language, but um, there's one line that says, you know, seriously, man, you look like something Free Willy threw up. But originally, I wrote the line as, seriously, man, you look like the inside of Free Willy's asshole. <laughs> so that, that's a director's cut there, writer's I cut. I like it. I like right. it. Exclusive. Simple Men's yeah. Comics YouTube channel exclusive right there. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that the, uh, the clan angle also is unique. I can almost envision that 80s movie style where like you've got like those 
um, almost warriors esque, where you've got the the individualized groups. Um, and 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 I I think whether we we talked immediately, Brian and I, when we first saw the book, um, Bloodsport came to mind, and I think that's a movie that we both we both like. And the uh, pose. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Without a doubt, the the cover the cover image to me was an immediate. Um, immediately struck a chord as a, a diehard Muhammad Ali fan to, to, to see the cover image and, uh, and it kind of have that look. So there's a lot of nostalgia packed into this book while at the same time, um, vibrant colors kind of looking very, very modern and sleek. And then you know how Mad Cave, if you've ever bought a Mad Cave comic book, Mad Cave, high, high quality paper, um, really well, well done actual physical product. So yes, yeah, so this will be uh, this will be airing here on YouTube on the channel um, on New Comic Book Day. Um, so we encourage everybody for sure. If you did not see the book in shops today, make sure you are talking to your LCS and make sure you are checking the Mad Cave website. They often have book copies, physical copies, um, as well as digital in the Mad Cave store. So make sure you're checking that for sure. Yeah. So I want to get. I'm always careful because I don't want to spoil the book, but I want to talk about how right. great I, I enjoyed this first issue. We get towards the end, and then the queen kind of sends Quinn somewhere, right? To the, what the labyrinth? Yes, the basically the queen. You know, she's going to be pretty important. Um, they just dropped the pre-order for issue three, by the way, and if you check out that cover. Uh, you know that features the queen, and she is she is a nice looking monarch. Let me tell you, um, I, I enjoy that cover quite a bit. Adagun did him uh, really outdid himself, but I think the real magic of the book comes from Maria Santanola and her coloring work. Um, and then you throw in Justin Birch with the lettering, in, and it's uh, it's magic. But yeah, the queen can teleport, folks. Um, they started in the first round, uh, the round of air. You know, they're fighting on these kind of floating platforms. And uh, the queen, she can teleport people. She can do a lot of other things. And you're going to find out a bit more about the full extent of her powers uh, in issue two as well. So one thing also at the end of that book, we got two more characters once he goes into the labyrinth. Why don't you tell us a little bit about those? Right yes, on. they're also important. That is uh, uh, Deadeye and the Glass Assassin. Uh, they are representing the Assassin's clan. And, um, you know, the Glass Assassin uses glass blades as her weapons. Uh, her sensei, Deadeye, like you said, he uses the bow, the bow and arrow kind of like a, a – he's a, probably a, a Hawkeye meets the Punisher because he's not afraid to kill anybody. So, Jane, you were talking about uh, cover art. I actually just pulled up the cover for issue number three, and it's fantastic. But we see on issue number two, we're going to see these two characters featured prominently right on the cover. Excellent-looking cover. So I like the fact that you guys are giving us kind of different cover – uh, characters throughout each of the first three issues. Is that something you guys are doing intentionally? Yes, that was my idea. Um, they let me come up with the character uh, cover designs, and I wanted to feature the characters on each cover. Um, different characters, except in uh, issue number five, we're going to get a repeat of Quinn um, again, uh, but it won't be Quinn alone like it was on issue one. Um, issue four is going to feature a uh, a villain who has not been featured. Not that you've maybe seen directly yet. Maybe there was just a hint of them in issue one. So I, I'm looking forward to you seeing that. But yeah, I, I like character-based covers. I always have. I liked it for Over the Ropes, and I was glad we got to continue that for Hellfighter Quinn with um, Deadeye and the Glass Assassin on the front of issue two. I, I, I like the action pose a lot, definitely. Now, one thing we noticed from Mad Cave, especially coming up this fall, is we're getting volume two of a lot of titles, even volume three of Battle Cats. Has there been any talk yet of volume two for Hellfighter Quinn, or is it kind of a wait and see approach, or any rumblings about that? There are no rumblings about it, um, or over the ropes now, for that matter. I, I think it's going to be a matter of, like you said, wait and see. Um, sometimes you don't know much about how a comic performs, even until six months after. 
So if you would like to see volume twos of Over the Ropes or Hellfighter Quinn, the best thing to do is to, you know, pick up those issues, whether it's from your local comic shop, uh, madcavestudios.com. Uh, digitals are available on Comixology. And, um, you know, whether it's the single issues or the trade paperbacks, um, you know, pick up the ones you like and buy one for a friend. Uh, introduce someone to Mad Cave Comics because so far, I've, everyone that's been introduced to it's enjoyed it that I've heard from. And hopefully issues get into more comic book stores with that new Mad Cave Champions program they launched and right? Yes, I, I didn't even know about that ahead of time. I know about some things that are in the pipeline that I can't talk about, but I, uh, I, I think that Champions for the retail side of things is going to be a great arrow in the quiver, so to speak. Right. From our perspective, just from what we've been able to see in the time that we've been covering Mad Cave Studios and the various releases, it just seems like that's the only, um, the only thing stopping getting these books into people's hands uh you know i i defy anybody to read the books and to see the quality and not enjoy it it's it, there's such a diverse kind of array of uh books released by mad cave there's kind of something for everybody the issue is just getting that distribution getting it into those stores it's so tough for retailers with so many books coming out on a weekly basis to make those picks and again that's one of the reasons why we have jay here um to kind of give you a little background and insight into this release so that you guys can uh, make those new comic book day decisions. Yeah, I'll definitely say I've enjoyed the library that Mad Cave's putting together. I mean, if you're a fan of those Mad Cave titles like Honor and Curse, um, Knights of the Golden Sun, Battle Cat, Midnight Task Force, that's a great one that a lot of people don't talk about, but this fits right into that library with all those other books. So I'd highly recommend you at least pick this up, give it a read. And if you have given it a read, let us know what you think. I mean, I enjoyed it, but I'm a Mad Cave champion myself. All right, so that's right, Brian. Make sure you guys go out there, support independent comics, head to your LCS, let them know you need to see those Mad Cave titles on the shelves. Make sure you're checking out Over the, uh, over the Ropes. <clears throat> Make sure you're checking out Over the Ropes and Hellfighter Quinn from Jay Sandlin. And Jay, is there anything else that people should be on the lookout for coming from you in the future? Always check back at my website, jsandlin.com. Sign up for my newsletter where you can get the uh, you know latest news and some free stuff, maybe before anybody else. I, like we said already, Over the Ropes, uh, March the 18th will be issue four. I can't believe that's already here. Um, and then Hellfighter Quinn uh, begins this month as well. I have another book that you can pick up on Amazon, uh, Space Police Files. It's my collection of sci-fi short stories, uh, not a graphic novel, but prose. So uh, check it out on Amazon, uh, leave a review, that would be great. And I'm gonna have some more to announce in April. I, I think you guys will be excited about some news dropping in April, so uh, maybe we can get back together for that. So we'll put links to all that in the description of this video, as well as links to Jay's social. So you follow him on Twitter and everywhere else he's at. But again, Jay, thanks for coming on Simple Man's Comics. Always welcome here. We love talking about, we have to come, have you come back and talk about Over the Ropes again, talk about wrestling or how, whatever. But Hellfire Quinn, great first issue. Highly recommend you guys pick it up. Fantastic read. This is Jay, Brian, and Jack with Simple Man's Comics. And Jack and I'll see you in the next video. Bodegas on the corner, let me see what's in store. Subway stations with the maps in the cars. Summer cookouts, uncle got the sandals on. Statue of Liberty, we holding up the torch. If they ask where I'm from, tell them this is New York. We from the home of the biggie, people blowing they ciggies.